to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the agenda, um, I want to wish complete sincerity and how much we're going to miss uh, Denise Donnelly as this is her last meeting. She has chosen not to run for re-election to the Board of Selectmen. And I want to thank Denise, uh, and I'd love to hear from other members of the board, of course, uh, for all her dedication for the last three years. She is clearly a steward of the environment, a very ethical person, um, and we could always count on her uh, to have an objective, fair view on everything. And, and uh, when I say we're going to miss Denise Donnelly, I mean that with all sincerity. So, Denise, we wish you luck. I know you're going to stay involved in the town and, and the things that make you passionate. And uh, But again, thank you for three wonderful years on the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. I, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve with all of you. And um, I have very mixed feelings tonight. So thank yeah. you, Paul, for your You're kind welcome. work. Yeah. Who is your favorite selectman? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Wow. Uh, hey. Selectman George. <laughs> I just want to say, Denise, I've learned so much from you. You're so, you know, um, passionate about the environment and the town and all the things that, that make Rockport special that I've really learned a lot from. Even though I've lived here all my life, I've learned a different aspect of town. And thank you very much for everything you've brought to the committee. And I wish you a lot of success, hopefully, on the planning board. And um, good luck with that next Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> uh, Selectman Wilkinson. I thought you were going to do this at the end. Now I'm probably going to cry <laughs> at the beginning of the meeting, which is not good. But um, I mean, honestly, not to repeat, but Denise, I don't, I mean, honestly, in all the time I've been on the board, which I think is the longest of all of us, I don't, know if, the I've, and, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever worked with anyone who gets so passionate about like one issue at a time. And I have learned so much from you about being passionate and just working so hard for something that you believe in, um, whether it's personally or professionally, but it has truly been an honor to be on the board with you. And um, the planning board's gain is, is surely our loss, but, but glad that you're sticking around and volunteering because the town is lucky to have you. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, Absolutely. God. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Denise, for all your hard work. All right, let's move on. Um, uh, we're going to have a covert uh, 19 data uh, presentation review. OK, that's me. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, let's see. Uh, do this slideshow presentation. So. Um, Rather than just updating the data that we've been tracking, um, I have those slides in here, but I also want to present some uh, information that focuses on the folks in Rockport who, ha who have had COVID-19 and who have recovered. So there'll be a little different presentation tonight so we can look at some of their characteristics. But let's, the, the basics, uh, you can see here, um, again, we're in relatively good shape. Um, there have been some minor increases, um, but no um, second, second wave or uh, expansion. There was actually an interesting comment um, on the State Health Department call this afternoon. As you know, they um, had pop-up testing last uh, Wednesday and Thursday for folks who uh, were at uh, protests and rallies. And um, so there was a substantial increase in uh, testing, but there was no increase in the percent positive, which was the good news. So it looks like from the preliminary data, again, it's fairly early, there doesn't seem like um, the folks who were involved in protests and rallies um, led to any increase early uh, infection. So that was good news. Um, these are data that, that we've seen before. Uh, the percent outcomes in terms of mortality are pretty much the same in Rockport, Cape Ann, and across Massachusetts. Um, sex distribution is similar. Um, age distribution is, um, again, uh, Rockport uh, has a much older distribution of cases, 
And, you know, we were talking last week about indicators to track. This might be a really important one for us if the age distribution in Rockport changes. Um, that um, is something that we need to pay, I think, proactive attention to because there's evidence as places have opened up around the country, um, there's been rising occurrence of COVID among younger populations. And as we open up, uh, a key indicator will be this age distribution to see what the impact potentially of opening up is in Rockport. So I think this is something we need to follow. Um, hospitalizations, again, um, KPN in general has a much higher hospitalization rate in Massachusetts, um, probably related to the age distribution, but I'm not exactly sure. It could also be related to testing. Um, underlying health conditions, pretty much the, the same in Rockport and Cape Ann. I'll skip over some of these slides. They will all, all be posted. Mitch, I'll send you the slideshow. Uh, after uh, the meeting today. You can see there's uh, 84 cases split equally in Rockport between uh, uh, cases acquired in long-term <coughs> facilities and community cases. And the good news is 60% of the cases in congregate uh, settings have recovered. So let me now focus on just a little more detailed description of folks who have recovered. Um, there have been 29 who have recovered from COVID. These are folks in the community as opposed to folks who are living in congregate facilities. I thought it would make sense just to focus on, on this group in Rockport. Um, uh, the sex distribution is um, pretty even. Um, the recovered persons, and you can see that um, about two thirds of the recovered persons in Massachusetts uh, were 50 years of age and older. Again, reflecting the distribution, I think, of the age of our COVID cases. Um, and most of the recovered cases, uh, four out of five in Rockport, um, did not require hospitalization. So the recovered cases, ten, uh, I think, probably tended to be um, slightly milder cases uh, than those requiring hospitalization. Um, and uh, um, here, the, the distribution of underlying health conditions for folks who have recovered um, is pretty equal in Rockport between um, no underlying conditions and those with underlying conditions, although the numbers are relatively small and there is a substantial portion uh, that are still under investigation. Uh, these are Rockport cases in congregate settings who have recovered. The um, 25 congregate uh, related cases, setting cases, um, have shown recovery. Um, and the distribution uh, of, by gender is pretty much the same in Rockport and Gloucester. Um, and the age distribution you can see um, 64%, uh, almost two thirds of the Rockport congregate setting cases um, were over the age of 70, um, clearly reflecting the nursing home population. And uh, the, most of the recovered cases in the congregate uh, facility did not require hospitalization, nine out of 10 cases. So, um, the good news again, I think uh, vigilance, vigilance still needs to be maintained, but we haven't seen any dramatic increases uh, in cases in Rockport or in Cape Ann. And I think now is the time for us to be thinking about um, setting parameters about when we see trends for increasing cases, um, what will the triggers be for increased vigilance, and perhaps um, change in the, the current status. I'm hoping we never have to do that, but it's quite possible that we will see rises uh, as things get more open in our town. Just wanna end with this slide. You can see 
um, again, the percent tested in Rockport um, is below the state average. Indeed, the percent of, of persons who have been tested um, throughout Cape Ann is lower than the state total. And we do need to get testing closer to uh, Rockport. Um, DPH has actually opened uh, a, a link for testing sites. The closest testing site here is the CVS in Ipswich. So um, if you go on the, the DPH link, you can see where testing sites are available. And I don't believe that you need any referral to the testing site in Ipswich and CVS. Finally, yes, the percent do. positive in Rockport still is uh, slightly higher than the state total, maybe reflecting uh, that the testing focused on uh, active cases or active exposures rather than uh, broader community testing. So that's, that's my presentation. Thank you. And I'll, any questions now or we can get to them later. Sid? Yeah, I have a question, Bruce. I'm unaware of what is the time frame between the time someone goes to a protest and the test may show positive, especially if these were pop-ups were within three or four days. Are they likely to have missed things? Um, uh, does anyone know what the, uh, the time frame is before tests start showing up positive once you've been exposed? Well, you know, I, I, you know, Barb and Ruth and Ron probably could address. I, I think most people think it's two to three weeks. So the pop-up testing probably would have been more effective in identifying Memorial Day gatherings and openings rather than uh, protest rallies, although some did occur um, before last Friday. But I, I think before we go hooray about the testing for the pop of the pop up testing for the protest, we ought to see what things are like in two or three weeks, which might be a lot more legitimate. Absolutely right. Okay. Yeah. Did Denise, everybody, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I have um, a comment or two questions. Uh, it was my understanding that you still need a doctor's order to get a test, even at CBS. Does anyone know for sure? Yes, you do. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah, you can't just go ask for a test. So on the website, it, it said no referral necessary, but that was confusing to me. Um, well, I think they're doing, they're doing two tests. I think they're doing a nasal swab uh, that they're trying to gather some data on, on whether that's going to be an effective um, methodology for testing. Uh, but for the nasal pharyngeal swab, the PCR um, testing, they are requiring physician or provider uh, referral. So I think they're trying to collect some data on the nasal swab. That's a self swab. But the um, my other, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, but for the pop up testing, I believe you did not need a referral. No, you no. didn't. No. Didn't need a referral for that one. Right. Um, my other question is how do you define recovered? Are, are these people who have no lasting health effects from having experienced COVID-19? Ch Chassie or Teresa, do you want to help here? We're considering um, recovered kind of out of the isolation period. If somebody has been cleared um, from isolation, we're marking them as recovered. They may still have the loss of taste, loss yep. of smell, but they can be out in the public. Okay. Chassie, this would also be a good opportunity, I think, if you could, you and Teresa could update us on contact tracing, how things are going. Yeah, we, um, since we've had a little bit of time to um, take a deep breath and um, really kind of um, close out our cases and look at our, at each case um, and, you know, mark people as recovered, which is a wonderful thing. We've also had time to look at our, um, our loss to follow up percentage. So we were able to look at all of our cases. And I believe our loss to follow up uh, percentage of all cumulative cases um, over time has just been 2%. So um, we are very effective in um, reaching cases and their contacts, um, whether people answer the phone um, from the local board of health or, 
or um, what the reason is. Um, we're very effective in getting through to people. So we're just gonna continue with that model. Thanks. Bruce, can I ask a question? Sure, Mirva. Um, looking on the DPH website, I noticed that they're now saying how many antibody tests they're doing every day, but they don't, I can't find anywhere on their website or in the data that you give us what the percent positive is for the for having the antibodies are, are you tracking that is the state is there is that knowable that is knowable you know we're notified if somebody tests positive and they're considered a probable case and we do follow up on those cases it's kind of an individual um look into what was going on and what made them get the um, antibody testing so do we know how many of those people are testing, what percentage of those folks are testing positive? I, you know, I, I'll, I'll see if I can find those data on the website. I'm pretty sure those are not available by town, um, but maybe there's a place on this uh, dashboard for state total. Or if anyone listening um, in the public knows where those data are available, please let us know. We'd be happy to, to share that information. The other question I have is, do the folks who have just the positive antibodies, are they considered a positive case? Like, are they going into the stats as a, a if like let's say they didn't have the PCR test and they just had the antibody test, are they then considered a case that's being counted? They're counted as a probable case. I see. And then, and then we investigate to see whether they're actively ill at this time. Um, we're seeing a lot of people um, who were sick back in March. Um, they were exposed to a, a positive case, but they themselves were unable to get testing at that time because they didn't fit the criteria. Right, right. So, uh, Teresa, are, are, positive. are you doing, uh, are people who test positive for antibodies uh, routinely given PCRs as well? We do recommend that. Um, and we are seeing we are seeing some of the fo those folks come through our drive-through for PCR. Yeah, it's just rarely done at the same time. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, we'd see people go for a serology and a PCR on the same day, but yep. we, we never see that. So it's, it's it ends wow. up being two steps. Well, we do. We're very happy about it. <laughs> it gives us a lot more information about what's going on. Yeah. Uh, we are too. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen. Um, <clears throat> at this point, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we'd like to continue on with the, uh, the selectman uh, part of the agenda. Uh, we have the consent agenda, uh, which uh, includes approval of minutes, 71 Long Beach uh, lease to reflect a transfer of ownership uh, appointment of seasonal parking control officers and solid waste service contract. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? There, there is. I move that the board approve all non-held items on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote. Uh, Selectman George? Aye. Selectman Wilkinson? Aye. Selectman Donnelly? Aye. And Selectman Murphy votes aye and the motion passes for zero. Thank you everyone. Uh, the action items. Uh, number one is a sign permit uh, for C and, and Seller. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, and then we'll, we can discuss it. Sure. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the sign permit request for C and Seller at 21 Dark Square, number three as submitted. Okay, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Move in seconding. Okay, uh, do we have anyone here uh, to discuss the sign? Uh, no um, discussion needed, Mr. Chair, from the individual. It's a standard request in front of the board. It's slightly larger than is currently allowed without the uh, selectman's approval. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, it looks really nice. I saw the plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I did too. It's going to fit nice between those windows. It looks yep. nice. It certainly will. That's great. Okay, uh, roll call vote. Uh, Selectman Donnelly? Aye. Selectman George? Aye. Selectman Wilkinson? 
Aye. Selectman so Murphy votes aye, and the motion passes for zero. That's great. Okay, moving on to the one twelfth budget approval. Is there a motion? Excuse me, a motion to approve the one twelfth budget approval. I move that the board of selectmen approve the one twelfth of the FYI twenty one operating budget as recommended by the town administrator and finance director, and and direct its transfer to the Department of Revenue. Okay, you've heard them. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Um, further discussion? Uh, Mitch, do you want to uh, just, I know what we're, we're talking about here, but it's just for the public. Sure, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so this is uh, required since our town meeting is after June 30th. This is a 112 budget plus um, any items that we normally pay out in July after the budget is approved. For example, we have several um, lump sum payments that are made every year. Uh, retirement is paid uh, in July for a discount. Um, our uh, portions of our contributions to the stabilization funds, et cetera, are made in July. Uh, so this is required. Uh, it'll go to DOR after the clerk certifies it tomorrow morning. Um, and it's, it's just to carry us through July uh, until we get to a town meeting. Um, it, it's in line with what the board previously looked at. Right. And what uh, discussed, it's really, it's, it's month one just to keep the uh, lights on, the paychecks going out and the bills being paid. Wonderful. Okay. Excellent. Any other further discussion from members of the board? Hearing none, let's go roll call vote. Uh, Selectman Donnelly? Aye. Selectman George? Aye. Selectman Wilkinson? Aye. And Selectman Murphy votes aye and the motion passes 4-0. And the last item on our action, li action list this evening is end of the year transfers. Uh, is there a motion? There is. Um... There is. Mr. Chair, I move that the selectmen approve and ask the chairperson to sign the following year-end transfers. $8,500 from civilian dispatch to lifeguards, $7,000 from legal fees to FICA Medicare, and $3,000 from civilian dispatcher to police equipment maintenance. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion on the transfers? Nope. Hearing, none, hearing none, roll call vote. Selectman Donnelly? Aye. Selectman Wilkinson? Aye. Selectman George? Aye. And Selectman Murphy votes aye, and the motion passes for zero. Very good. And we're going to, I'm going to take a break here and uh, pass it over to uh, Dr. Newman for the Board of Health. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, we have three sets of minutes that were distributed. Um, May 28th, June 2nd, and June 9th. And uh, we discussed the May 28th minutes last meeting last week. And um, there was some discussion. Sid, uh, you brought up some points on page two under consideration of current or additional restrictions related to COVID-19. And we have a, an updated version of these uh, minutes. Did you provide the text? Yes. For this? Yes. No. So obviously you're satisfied with it. Um, is there any further discussion of this set of minutes, especially the section that Sid uh, changed? No? No. All right. And we've all had the opportunity to see June 2nd and June 9th minutes. Are there any concerns or questions, proposed addenda, anything? No. We have a motion then regarding the minutes. I make a motion. We approve the uh, previous uh, three meetings minutes that haven't been done with the additional corrections of the 28th of uh, May. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second? I second. I second. Okay. Do we have any other discussion? No. Can we just raise our hands all in favor of accepting the minutes? We need to do a roll call okay. vote. We need it? Okay. You need a roll call vote. Okay. Roll call vote. Bob McCarthy? Approved. And, uh, Sid Wedmore? Yes. Bruce Cohen? Yes. Mary Beth Murphy? Yes. And I vote yes. So thank you. Five nothing. All right. The second item on our portion of the agenda regards the septic 
upgrade at 4 Irvana Road. Um, Leslie, do you want to lead us off? Sure. John Judd is here to present the plan for 4 Irvana Road. And um, do we want to hear his presentation first? Yes, great. Great. John? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, uh, the board. Uh, for the record, John Judd, engineer with Gateway Consultants. This is a uh, an upgrade to uh, an existing failed septic system at Fort Four uh, Irvana Road. It's owned by Barbara Baker, and uh, this is a uh, again a replacement system that asks requests for three variances as shown on the plan. Uh, Mitch, I'm not sure if they the other um, yeah, if we can put that up, that's great. Uh, so what we have is uh, uh, we have a wetland area on the uh, northerly portion of the, the corner of the property at uh, Kelowna and Irvana is shown in the, the shaded portion and uh, the existing house is shown over, uh, is, is labeled. And uh, the again, we have a failed uh, cesspool on the property that is uh, not functioning clearly at the property. So. Uh, we've upgraded the system to meet Title V. We are looking for um, three variances as shown in the plan, um, primarily doing, uh, due to the groundwater and the, uh, the proximity of the wetlands on the property, but it, it's certainly an improvement over what's there. We're gonna be uh, looking for reduced setback to the wetlands uh, for the tank and the, um, the field, and we are looking for a one foot reduction to the uh, required four foot offset to groundwater table, that's the vertical offset. Uh, we're gonna be using a pressure distribution as a uh, standard policy with the uh, Rockport Board of Health when looking for that variance. And the last, um, uh, the last variance is actually a, a conservation commission uh, variants, which is the same uh, situating components within 100 feet of the uh, the wetland area. Uh, so that's a brief presentation, and I can answer. Well, Leslie can answer any questions that you might have. <clears throat> Leslie, your thoughts? I think the plan is very good. Okay, John, how far is the setback from the wetlands? I can't really. Okay, so on the chart, we have a 100 foot requirement uh, where we're pro uh, proposing 98 feet to the tank, and that's just so we can, um, you know, ensure that we have gravity flow from the house into the tank. And then to the field, we're 62 feet. And what was the previous on that? Uh, the previous is a, uh, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a failed septic. Um, cesspool which is adjacent to the tank and that's it's uh closer to 100 however it's in the groundwater and there's no room uh to put the the new leach field in that location so the the old leach field was closer to the house like to the left of the existing dwelling there where the tank is now correct correct and, and it's it, it, cesspool it wasn't a leach field so oh i see okay yeah. So it's just the, the variance for the wetland, uh, for the leach field, and for the tank. So those are the two variances that you're looking for? Yes, and also uh, we're looking for a reduction to the required four feet above the seasonal high water table. Oh, yes. Yep. Any other oh. questions? Yeah, what is there a setback to the the property line on these um, leach fields? Yeah, that's typically it's uh, ten feet minimum. We meet all those requirements. We do because that looks kind of close there. Okay, thank you. Sure. John, how old is the old one? Well, it's an old. Uh, it's as old as the house, from my, what I understand. And if we look back in the records. Um, you know, we have plans out here from the 50s. Oh, okay. Any other questions or comments? No. Ron, uh, if uh, I would, I would make a motion we accept this plan with the variances. Anytime you have a cesspool, you have. Um, 
the uh, public health uh, at risk, and that's uh, an area where there is a lot of swampy areas around. This will definitely be an improvement, especially with the pressure distribution system. And I don't think the uh, uh, variances are of big consequence, especially when you're improving a system with a modern design. So I move we accept it. I Thank second you. that motion. We have a second. Any other discussion? No? Uh, Bruce, how do you vote? Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Okay, Sid? Yes. Mary Beth? Yes. Barb? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, it passes unanimously. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. And that's, uh, that completes Section D for us. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Um, <clears throat> let's go to uh, letter E, uh, the COVID-19 testing. Is there any uh, update uh, that either board should know about and the public? Um, actually, uh, we have gone to universal testing of all inpatients. Um, so we now have a broader base of folks that are coming to the hospital that we are um, just testing, not symptom-based, but universally. So all inpatients, all, so that includes all labor and delivery patients, all med surge and ICU patients, all behavioral health patients, all OR surgical patients, all procedural patients. So we're getting close to um, what I would call a more public health model of testing. I would say that we have not found a lot of folks that have come for non-COVID related illnesses or for procedures or um, care that have turned up positive. Um, so I think that um, what we're seeing is a, a pretty healthy group of folks coming back into healthcare right now. So we continue to plug away at it. Uh, we continue to look for that second uh, test site on Cape <laughs> Ann. I continue to try to strum, strong arm a few people um, into doing that. I still have a few tricks up my sleeve to be able to do that. And um, uh, we're con continuing to work on it bit by bit. I would say also that um, Ron, I don't know what you've heard, but I think we're getting closer to uh, a, a testing methodology that will give us results probably in the four to six hour time window versus the 24 to 72 hour time window. Uh, and that will be a dramatic improvement over what we have right now. Um, our lab director has got four or five different um, vendors um, on the hook and uh, we'll explore each and every option, knowing that some of those at any point in time could, could fail with testing methodologies and, and supply source and those sorts of things. So that, that will be a uh, great benefit. I don't know if you've heard anything new, Dr. Newman, that I haven't heard. No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's great news. So we continue to work on it. Yeah, Sid. Yeah, Bob, have all the hospital staff been tested? including um, janitorial people, aides, food workers, because if we're testing all the patients, that's half the ball score, but we ought yeah. to be testing all of the people who work there. Yeah, we, we screen everybody, and I would say we folks have done a nice job screening. They identify themselves quickly and get, them folk, get themselves to employee health, um, which does put folks out of work. We've had in the triple digits, numbers of employees out, out of work um, for signs and symptoms. And so the quarantining piece has gone well. We've not found anything that we've even thought of as person-to-person -person transmission within the hospital either. So, you know, that's sort of one of my triggers as well, um, that uh, we're not in a good place. But we've not uh, seen any, any hint of that at all. But universal testing, um, no, and I don't think anybody's really doing that right now, Sid, but we, we do keep our eye on that. Well, if, if, how are you doing the screening? If you're screening people by symptoms or screening people by temperature, uh, you're not going to pick up all of those asymptomatic people there who are still spreaders. Yeah, I think the other piece of it is, um, is that the mask use is universal. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's sort of, the, that's the catch-all method, is that 
Um, everybody gets a mask at the time of entry um, as an employee, and they change those out every day. We have bins at all the entrances to be able to um, uh, change those out. And folks like me are out and about watching for that mask use um, all the time. So I think that's our catch-all uh, to make sure that we're not having spread before people um, have signs and symptoms. And I think that's an important point, Barb, is that the universal indoor mask use is huge. And yeah. I think it's the one thing that we all need to just keep hammering away on this board, whether we're talking about the schools, restaurants, mm -hmm. or if you're inside any place except for your own home, you've got to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if any place said that's doing universal testing of employees. I can certainly and I have a pretty risk, big risk management group, I'll ask out there and see if any folks are doing that yet. I've not heard that, but that would be a good question for the next meeting. I'll get back to you. Well, in, in looking at the future too, um, when we start thinking about opening up places like Shailen Lou and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, we can do what we're doing, but that's still a very thin sieve. When testing is, is widely available, it would be possible to consider a scenario where anyone who signs up to listen to an opera at Shailen Lewin buys the tickets has to present a test result before they get in when the show finally goes on. Yeah, that would, that would be the sort of the, probably the end game. I think if we can get out ahead of that in more universal screening before they ever get to the door um, and give folks a chance to get that done, we should, yeah. So we'll see. Um, I keep chipping away at it every week, um, looking to get to that public health model of universal, just universal screening. And it's gonna help, you know, Chassie, it's gonna help uh, Teresa and a lot of their contact. Um, Thank you. You know, Bruce, um, just a question about that since, uh, uh, Dr. Wedmore brought it up. So if someone comes into this town right now and is say renting, renting a hotel room or renting an Airbnb or whatever, aren't, are we still in the phase where we're supposed to be quarantining for two weeks if you're coming in from another state? Um, I, it's, I, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, Jen's are shaking their head, yes. You know, if they're not, if folks aren't going to be, if they're coming in for a weekend, um, yeah. you know, can they come in and can they go out and participate in, you know, all the wonderful things we have to offer? Um, I think, I, I'm, I don't know the answer to that question. Does anyone else know? I believe it's still it was in place. Yeah. 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 Unenforceable, but yes, it's still in place. Wow. You know, because I know that up in Maine, you know, the hotels... And the motels are requiring their guests to prove that they'd have a negative test before they can stay. They can stay in an inn or, or hotel or a motel. And, you know, is that something that we can do locally? Um, our hotels are opening up phase two, like they opened up on Monday, right? I think we're past that. I mean, I think they're open. I think several of them were actually full this past weekend. I, I think that if we were to enforce that, that would essentially shut down the tourist industry. Oh, absolutely. In Rockford. But, you know, um, something to think about is as we've sort of tamed this, the first surge in Massachusetts, we see from the numbers in Rockport that there's you know, very little in the way of new cases. Other parts of the country are experiencing the opposite. And I think that the difference between our case load and in say the southwest and florida etc will grow to be much greater and so um the reason for you know enforcing that quarantine is going to become greater and greater i mean the necessity for it if we're going to prevent new transmission from people bringing it to rockport but i don't know how we enforce that or whether our economy would you know would tolerate it I, I and agree, I think, Ron. Like, you know, I, I think the guidelines to... requiring um, hotels and inns to 
you know, to clean, to not offer breakfast, to remove all materials from rooms, et cetera, et cetera. The checklist is pretty extensive to, to allow opening, but to try to uh, prevent any, any spread and transmission. And I think if we're gonna, you know, open up inns, uh, hotels, motels, and bed and breakfast, we need to rigorously follow those guidelines. That's why, again, I think it's really important. Uh, um, you know, we talked briefly about it last last week. If there are people who come and visit and go back to their hometowns, whether they're in Massachusetts or other states, and test positive, it would be really important for us to get that information as soon as possible. Um, they won't count as resident increases here. Um, directly, although they might lead to some for uh, workers here in town, but we need to, as a tourist destination, really figure out how to track if uh, folks are bringing in exposures. Bruce, right now, is there any um, communication between states as far as tracing? Uh, Massachusetts has done a pretty good job on tracing. Uh, other states have been um, less uh, enthusiastic uh, on that. But if someone is tested positive in Arizona and they spent a week or two weeks ago in uh, an inn in Rockwood, do we get that information from uh, Arizona or are we on silos? We should get that information. Yeah, we should get that information. It may take a little while. We, they do have interstate um, communication um, at the state level. Sometimes, you know, we'll get a call at the local level, but usually that happens at the state level. Yeah, but I it think can it take goes, some time. Yeah, it goes through the division of global migration and quarantine. Yeah. So if we wow. are notified of a case, um, like say it's a Rockport resident, who tested positive, but who had just flown on a flight from another state. We gather all of the information about what, what airline they traveled on, the seat they sat in, who they were with, if they, if they switched seats on their flight. And we give that all to our state health department and then they give the information to the other states involved. And the other states are doing it just as fastidiously? They should be. <laughs> Should be, don't count. Right. Oh, we hope. I mean, the only thing to, um, you know, we know that this has been done long, long before COVID-19. So we do this with other diseases like tuberculosis, measles, mumps, um, things like that. So there's a, there's a, a process in place that we've been using for a long time. Okay, anything else? Okay. Hearing none, let's uh, head on to the next uh, agenda, uh, 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 agenda item. Consideration of current or additional restrictions related to COVID-19. Uh, anything that, that enforcement of the uh, Board of Selectmen or Board of Health, uh, anything that we need to talk about, reduce. Um, anything from anyone on that? Are we, yes, uh, Dr. Wedmore. Yeah, I, I brought that up because uh, the premise has been, uh, the, in, in like the minutes that were corrected on the 28th of May, the premise is when all is said and done, uh, when there are egregious violations of the rules that the Board of Health puts in place, uh, we enlist police uh, to help us with that. And Bob sent an email saying that on one of the recent Department of Public Health reports, they were strongly uh, emphasizing this is not a local police uh, involvement. If that's the case, how do you practice not? Yeah, and it also, you know, I think um, part of this agenda item too is, you know, how do we help um, the chief and his officers um, sort of do some of this, um, 
you know, this enforcement and not put them in a, in a bad position. Um, a lot of it's coaching, some of it is training, some of it is those sort of non, I don't want to call them non-confrontational, but there's the, you know, the soft side of, of compliance and how do we help the folks that are at that front line and the other businesses. We talked about this at the business call as well um, because businesses could also see folks that are, um, that are not complying with the rules and how do we help them to do this correctly but also ramp it up and, and use the police when, when we need to but enlist other folks in town to help us with the compliance issue and not just leave it to the police but use them when we need to, uh, as Dr. Wedmore said, for those cases where it's not been um, consistent or we've we've asked for compliance and it's not worked. Yeah. So. I, I would say the same is true for the um, staff at the transfer station. I've experienced many people, I would say, who are not in compliance at the transfer station. Um, some not even having a mask in their on their person. Um, others just wearing it like a beard. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what we do to get the message through or to help the transfer station staff who already have enough to do um, to to get people to c comply. You know, um, we we talk, we discussed this at our reopening committee meeting this morning a little bit because I think the kind of general consensus. For example, I was fishing this past weekend, and from my boat, I could see the the jetty part of bearskin neck and probably 95 percent of the dozens of people families out there had masks on and were wearing them properly and so we talked about kind of getting the message across that we're proud to be you know on the conservative side and the downtown area needing to wear masks and the transfer station and we're proud of our numbers that our numbers are really reasonable and you know knock on wood they've they seem to have um stabilized at, at least at this point but we talked about just kind of getting the you know getting the word out there and supporting everyone in town that works to say you know don't be embarrassed to you know say to say to someone in the car next to you you know masks are required like don't ever put yourself in an uncomfortable situation but everyone should be proud of living somewhere where you know, if Rockport gets the reputation of people come here because it's downtown is a safe place and masks are required, that's a good thing in our view. So I think it's really about you know, finding positive ways to support the law enforcement and, and the inspector. And, you know, maybe just at the reopening, we're going to talk to the chief more in our next meeting to see what else we can do to support them. I have a colleague of mine that uh, was in Rockport this weekend, uh, and she told me that she was downtown on Bearskin Neck, and she said she saw everyone wearing masks. She, she thought that was great, and I said, that's wonderful to hear. But my understanding, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is you would need to have a mask if you cannot socially distance. And that would be a, a, a perfect example is at the transfer station. No, no, no. no. In Rockport, you're required to wear uh, face covering downtown. Downtown? No, I mean out, outside of downtown. Mm -hmm. Outside. And yeah. at the transfer station. And yes, at the yes, transfer yes. station. I, I should have prefaced that, excuse me. I, I wonder, uh, Sarah, it would be great if positive reinforcement uh, would work. Um, and I don't know that it always does. I, and I don't want to put the burden on um, the chief and the police department, but I wonder if there would be occasional patrols and a presence um, da both oh. downtown and at the beaches. Um, just okay, Mitch, Mitch can talk about that. There's a lot, there's a lot going on. Oh, oh, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, one of the items that I referenced um, in, in my, my, my update tweet that um, we have, uh, we've been paying every, every week for several days a week, um, firefighters and forest firefighters to go around and do educational enforcement We've had uh, police details downtown as well. Um, uh, officers on bikes and officers uh, on, on, on foot patrol have been down there. And um, the chief has been very clear with his officers that it is education, not confrontation. Um, so handing out masks to people, reminding people, um, and in, in many cases, in, in many small towns, that's what's there. It's the police who are trying to handle the 
educational component because they're in many cases the first call. Um, but we've been very cognizant about having uh, you know, the educational folks, the firefighters and the forest firefighters go out um, and engage with people and try to say, hey, you know, this is required. Um, certainly if something escalates, they let dispatch know, but um, we're not seeing too much of that. We're really not seeing too, too much of that. We're giving out a lot of masks, but um, we're not seeing a lot of people who are um, being overly uh, upset or hostile uh, toward, towards folks. I think two weeks ago, the chief said they had given out well over a thousand masks. Wow. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And I, I think too, up at the transfer station, when you go in, the guy flags you in way up at the end, right before you get in there, um, just getting, when you get to dump your trash and stuff, I don't know why he couldn't just say, do you have a mask? And if not, hand you one. It's one of the town masks. So let's just maybe ask him if they could start doing that to make sure people do have one or turn them away. Say, oh, I'm sorry, you can just go around that trailer and leave. You need to have a mask. You either wear one that I have or, you know, turn them away. Are, yeah. are we getting a significant amount of complaints of people not wearing uh, masks at the transfer station? I've witnessed it. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing I mean, what it. Le I what, what, level, what level is it at? Do we know? Do we have a gauge on that? Yeah. I, I, I don't. I don't know if it's that bad, honestly. When I've been, I haven't, I, I actually in the last few weeks have seen everyone except oh. like, because I watch really closely. I saw one person at the brush pile not wearing a mask last mm -hmm. Saturday, but besides that, everyone had a mask on. So I think it, you know, it's one of those things. It depends when you drive up the neck. It yep. depends when you go to the transfer station. You know, it's yep. not a hundred percent, obviously, no, but it never will be it's pretty good. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Uh, Wedmore. Well, I think Ruth brought up a very easy and simple solution. There is a God who waves you through, and he could very easily, uh, uh, if there's no one, if one does not have a mask, simply say, oh, by the by, a mask is required here, and if you don't have one, here's one on the top. And that would increase from the 97%, perhaps, to maybe 99%. Very easy fix. Someone who's there who's already on the ticket being paid. I say something, yep. I, um, I've sort of avoided downtown ever since this has all started. Um, but this Sunday, this past Sunday, I, I walked my dog down and I was curious to see, uh, in particular, how people were following the, the rules. And I was kind of shocked when I walked past Front Beach. It was about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. The, at that point in the day, people were leaving the beach. And I know people are not required to wear masks if they're sitting on their blankets 12 feet away from everybody else. But I would say that people kind of streaming off the beach, I don't think there was more than 10 or 15% of people wearing masks. I had to walk down the middle of Granite Street because both sidewalks on either side, I mean, on, on uh, Beach Street, because on both sidewalks, people were walking, most of them without any masks. So I was surprised and disappointed at that. But on the other hand, we're looking at the number of cases in town very carefully, and we're seeing really very few cases. Our beaches have been open for a while. I'm assuming this is the level of mask wearing that we've been seeing all along. So I think unless we see negative repercussions of the status quo, I'm not sure that we need to kind of rein in if we get very, very strict, it's gonna have an impact on businesses and other aspects of the functioning of the town. But I think we should be prepared that should we begin to see even, you know, modest increases that we have to jump on it and maybe enforce, you know, more rigorously. I think it's smart to have masks available at, at, with the police department, which obviously they've given out roughly a thousand, but it would be, it would, uh, be a good idea to also have um, them available at the transfer station and pass them out in a non-confrontational way uh, to the few people that aren't using them. Yep, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have DPW uh, provide the attendant with some and make sure that he's aware of what he should do. Good. Mitch, I think it would be perhaps a good idea on um, your, your call to remind people when they leave Front Beach, a mask is required if they're continuing to walk downtown. Okay, so a little uh, 
little more clear on that. Okay, I'll um, I'll also make sure that we update the language a little bit on the restrictions list on the website to stress that a little bit more. Great. Okay. Anything else, uh, Dr. Wedmore? Yeah, just just one thing in opening up. Um, the uh, uh, Thatcher Island uh, is now open to kayakers in private boats if you get out there. Uh, we're not going to be doing the tourist boats uh, and the towers will remain closed. But we thought uh, since the Audubon has opened up their parks and Fish and Wildlife has as well, uh, that it makes sense to be consistent with the other parts of the island. So uh, the website now says that if you uh, uh, can get out to the islands on a kayak or your own a boat, you're welcome to walk around and enjoy the trails and the uh, landscape. Good idea. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Great. Anyone else? Okay, moving right along. Let's go to uh, letter G, uh, long-term care and congregate living uh, facilities updates. Do we have anything on uh, Milver Park and oh, other yep. places? Um, I'll update you um, on Milbert Park I, and the Housing Authority. I talked to Lee Duda down there. They're doing well. Um, everyone is staying socially distant. They haven't opened anything up yet. They don't have any people coming in except for individual caregivers for patients um, who, or clients that are there. And they're going with the state guidelines and they'll probably in three or four, with, level three or four, where they can open up things there. I also talked to Dawn the manager at Pigeon Cove Ledges and Rockwood High School Apartments, same thing. They're doing very well. They have no cases, no That's suspicious. Great. That's wonderful. Cases. And then I talked to Heather over at the Old Farm Inn Supportive Living Center and all of their, they have four um, clients over there and they have numerous staff and everyone is testing negative now. So they're doing well also. That's great. Good. I think they really appreciate the weekly calls. They know that they can call me if they have any questions and need masks or any other type of PPE. So they're good. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's go to letter H, the reopening advisory uh, committee updates. Barb and Sarah Wilkinson, do you have anything for us? Um, we do. Um, so reopening uh, group has been really busy. Last week, we hosted a meeting for all, um, all business owners in town were invited. We had over 40 business owners attend, and I thought it was a great meeting. We shared, um, and Barb kick in at any time. Um, business owners shared kind of tips and tricks who are already open. We learned some, some cool stuff that people are doing. Um, and then we, we kind of outlined the local guidelines. We gave them an update on the restaurants. At the end, we asked, we're gonna meet again, probably um, maybe early in the week of the fourth, kind of in another week or so. And we asked if they wanted to kind of split up, you know, and just and meet galleries and restaurants and then innkeepers separately, but they all seemed to agree overwhelmingly that they like to meet in the large group. Um, we shared some updates from the Board of Health, Board of Selectmen, people seemed really, really, happy just with the open communication and um, you know we shared what we're doing to, to support the local businesses. Barb, do you have anything else on that? Yeah, no, and I think um, you know part of our discussion in, in our upcoming meeting is uh, you know we've got 4th of July coming so you know is there a ramp up in how we help businesses uh, and support businesses through those through that um, that weekend which could be uh, busier than we saw last weekend yeah. um, which will be something we'll talk about. And then when to schedule that next um, all business meeting. Yep, yep. But that was, Which I agree that, went really well. Yeah, it was great. Um, and as you've probably noticed, a few of the restaurants have, um, additional restaurants have started outdoor seating. Seems to be going really well so far. Um, where there's one application, I believe it's the Red Skiff for um, our two boards to um, entertain a, a little bit later down the agenda. But um, so far, so good. Thanks to John Kulon, uh, food inspector, for acting so efficiently and kind of, you know, going out of his way to just make sure that, you know, he's handling restaurants. I know that people are investing a lot of money. The town has invested in a lot of money. 
but um, so far so good. And I think when you drive downtown now, it looks, it's keeping in the spirit of Rockport, but it's looking more alive. I drove past Dock Square today and every table outside the Blue Lobster Grill was full. Nice, yeah. So, and yeah. somebody said that my place um, was booked over the weekend. So I think, I think we're on the right track with, you know, kind of supporting and, you know, a few people have said, well, what are you doing for the shops? But honestly, we're, we're lifting everyone how we, however we can. And by lifting the restaurants, we're hoping to lift, lift all businesses. Because when people come and they're able to find food, they'll stay longer and they'll shop and they'll hopefully spend a night. So um, I think that so far things are, things are going well down there, you know, downtown especially. And then um, today we, in our meeting today, we discussed outdoor displays. So our next step is um, either today or tomorrow, the Board of Selectmen's office is releasing the outdoor display application for the season. And then um, at one of our meetings next week, we'll kind of review all of those applications and then pass them along to the Board of Selectmen. And we talked about last week for the Board of Health to kind of review, but our group is gonna do kind of a first pass as we see what we can do, what we can allow out, outside for, for retail to support. There, oh, go ahead, Sarah, I'm sorry. No, that's it. Um, <clears throat> is there any appetite, no pun attended, uh, to uh, look at those Jersey barriers? I've had, uh, um, not complaints, but some people have suggested maybe put some buoys or lo lobster traps, kind of to doll them up a little bit to soften them up. And, and if so, who would be uh, the person to do that? I think that if people wanted to donate, um, notice I said donate because the town has made a significant several thousand dollar investment in the Jersey barriers. So nothing permanent can be done to them because they're going to be repurposed for DPW and that type of thing. But if someone would like to donate even temporarily yeah. lobster traps or some kind of decorations, they should contact uh, the selectman's office, I would say. Right, Mitch? But we Yes, they, they aren't in a position to paint them either. Yeah, we can't pay. Yes, they can cut. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they, they okay, very good. Yep. And they can honestly they can even reach out to reach out to me and I can, you know, I'm happy to talk to people about it. I think Barb has more to add to from our meeting. Go ahead, Barb. Yeah, we're also going to spend a little bit of time over the next week and at our next meeting talking about the library. You know, I think it's uh used a, a lot by our seniors. Um I Hang on, Barb, you got to unmute. Okay. Try again. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit time uh, time at our next meeting talking about the library. Um, it's used so much by our seniors. We want to make sure that they feel comfortable using the library again. We want to make sure that um, there's a, a good understanding of um, how this virus can and cannot be transmitted on a piece of paper, i.e. a book, um, and make sure that we're following the state guidelines but also being uh, somewhat reasonable and, and helping to make sure people feel comfortable and confident using the library again and helping the staff feel comfortable about that as well. So we're going to spend a little bit of time next week on that. Thanks, Barb. Good. Anyway, uh, Dr. Wedmore? Yeah, going back to Sarah's point about the uh, New Jersey barriers, um, I commend the opening uh, uh, committee because when you start going down uh, town, you see the tables out, the umbrellas, it's, it's not exactly a trattatoria, but it is a bit more welcoming than it has been, certainly. And the New Jersey barriers, could that not be a mural upon which we could have some kids do some artwork? can always be taken off when you use them up at a different place, but maybe emphasize that as some participation in the kids in beautifying the town. Mm. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think that, since we're not sure where they're gonna be used next, I don't think we can, we can paint or do anything like that on them, but maybe we can come up with something creative. I'll, I'll, give, yeah. that, I'll give that some thought. I mean, it's a, it's a great idea. Yeah. Just, Oh, we just have to be able be able the DPW has to be able to use them for like official town business after so we just have to be careful that we don't um, shoot ourselves in the foot on that one but let me give it some thought that's a great idea well you know the, the, the point is Sarah uh, those are gray barriers now if you end up with a lot of murals on them you can repaint them gray and no one will know the difference and they're still versus versatile just as functionally useful 
think. And yeah, and Art Haven did something. They did the you know the great murals on on the walls using uh, tape. You know, so there may be some sort of uh, temporary things we could do as well. It's a great idea, Sid. Well, yeah. We can bring it back to our group. Yep. It looks like Sid's going to um, host a, a coloring station down at Doc Square next week. <laughs> 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 this, this week we entered step two of phase two with with new openings. Yeah. Uh, is that going to are we going to address that lower down in the agenda, or is this the appropriate place? Um, because now there's indoor dining is uh, is allowed, and I don't know whether we're go going to go through the same or a similar process with applications and plans reviewed the way we did for outdoor dining, uh, or should we do that when John does oh, no. his review? Yeah, well, we, 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 yeah, that's fine. Yep. Um, so John Kulan is here, and um, John, correct me if I'm wrong. There's no uh, there's no requirement to do the plans, but you are making visits to those folks. Correct. Uh, we're not requiring written plans, especially since uh, I inspected uh, the, the restaurants uh, when. Uh, they were looking to uh, 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 reopen and uh, uh, be set up for uh, takeout or or, uh, or delivery. <clears throat> and the uh, at, at that time, in most cases, uh, we discussed uh, what their uh, setup would be, what their plans would be, the process <clears throat> when indoor dining uh, was allowed again, while uh, still employing the uh, uh, the mandates and guidelines for COVID-19 compliance. And uh, a number of, of folks have said it's, it, today, it is just not um, uh, practical for them to, uh, to open up uh, indoors. How many uh, customers could they have indoors uh, while maintaining a six foot distance and the cleaning of frequently touched uh, surfaces and making sure that everybody uh, uh, was wearing a mask before they came in. <clears throat> and uh, therefore, uh, some folks have st stayed with either a takeout or, or delivery, um, be it uh, to home or, or curbside. And uh, when you get right down uh, into each and every establishment, you see how uh, one place it seems to be just ideal for indoor dining and maintaining distance and others are on the, the other extreme. So I've uh, uh, generally supported uh, whatever people have, have been deciding. And there is, uh, uh, the, the longer we are in this, this, uh, uh, this pandemic, the more people are uh, not only educating themselves, but looking at how they can uh, maintain the mandates and guidelines and uh, still stay uh, as, as a profitable business. So uh, part of the function that I'm trying to provide is a, a, a sounding board, although uh, it's not my decision unless given to me whether to approve or not approve of uh, whatever somebody is, uh, 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 is proposing. Uh, it's generally working out very well. Anyone else? For any other comments regarding this? Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, how about other aspects of this most recent opening? I don't. I don't know if there are barber shops and well, not barbers because they've been open for a while. But you know, the other pers up close personal care uh, services. Nails. Do we have any of those around town that that uh, will be opening? I don't know. Yeah, nail salons. Yeah. We have those, and yeah. and, do, and, do the, and are they inspected, or are they they're not approved? Evidently, if restaurants are not being approved. I don't know that. Yeah, actually, I don't know if nail salons are are approved. Um, I'll add the. I actually haven't added the nail salon link to our our business reopening guide, but I'll, I'll add that, I'll add that probably this evening. So we have a link to each, each type of um, business as they open 
just to the state guidelines and checklist, but maybe that's a question for, um, that'd be a John. Actually, actually, the, this morning today, uh, when I was at graduation in Saugus, two of my colleagues were uh, complaining that nail salons aren't open. So maybe that's the case. I don't know why I remember that, but I don't think they are open. They're part of part two, phase two, yep. I think. Yeah. Do we have any in Rockport? I'm trying to think. What's that? Do we have any nail salons in Rockport? We do. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There. Um. Yes, uh, Dr. Wedmore. Yeah, uh, I believe the Gloucester Nail Salons are open this week. Leastwise, my wife came back with new nails, and I don't think she got that done at the transfer station. <laughs> <laughs> so, can we, uh, John Kulan, is that a, is that a question? Um, I know it's not a food inspection, but are, th are they in? They can be um, uh, approved to open if they present uh, a plan that um, uh, complies with the mandates and guidelines uh, set by the state and anything further by, by the town. Uh, the town has not gone any further uh, than the state, but it is a, uh, uh, a challenge uh, for any of the personal care businesses to um, uh, to comply, but while it is a challenge, it is not insurmountable if they uh, they choose to commit to the the mandates and guidelines. There are, uh, uh, as Dr. Wedmore referenced, uh, there there are these the businesses that are uh, opening in other communities, and that is uh, only those businesses that have uh, committed, uh, to my understanding, to to doing it right and uh, the right way is to go on to one of the links that, that you have been providing and uh, uh, just check the boxes, fill in the blanks, sign when you're ready to commit to it and, uh, and go forth. Uh, uh, certainly masks uh, must be used, distancing must be used, uh, and the frequent cleaning of frequently touched surfaces uh, must be done. And it is best to have that in a plan that can be then uh, verified. So uh, we will entertain any plan uh, from any uh, business person who wishes to submit it. And of course, we caution people against uh, just going ahead and opening without uh, the approval of the appropriate town officials, because uh, that, that, that's just a recipe for disaster. Okay. So from Mitch, have we gotten any plans, do you know? You or Leslie responsible for inspecting and improving uh, plans for personal service businesses in Rockport? We have not had any uh, applications to my knowledge. Um, Mitch, uh, do you know of any? So there's nothing that's come in regarding the control plans. Um, Leslie, have you, how, how have you handled personal care businesses in the past in, in general? So their licenses are through state agencies, not through the local boards of health. Um, my understanding of the state rules currently are that when a business self-certifies, residents, customers can make a complaint to the town and then the board of health would go and investigate. So that's, I think, the mechanism that's in place statewide. So are these self-certifications required to be filed with the towns? No, they're not required to be filed um, according to the state guidelines. Well, but in Rockport, we actually were requiring them for, um, did we require them for all businesses? You, you did. So what we'll, what we'll do is um, have Kelsey touch base with those couple of businesses in the next few days just to make sure they're aware that that requirement exists. Yeah, so basically our point in doing that was not to increase the workload for any business and not to be a barrier to opening. So we just simply ask that they take the state self attestation. Um, and a lot of them are also just sending in the checklist. A lot of businesses you see the checklist taped up in the window and just um, sending that by email to the COVID-19 email address, just like the restaurants and retail stores. 
and then we keep it on file. And that way, if there's any issue, the health inspector or board of health knows who to reach and kind of who's managing. So I think it'd be great if we could reach out to those businesses as well and just let them know that. I think there's I'll only- I'll take care Great. Stop it. <laughs> I, was yelling, I was yelling at my dog, not you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Barking at somebody. Great. I think we're good on reopening, Paul. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Barb, for the update. Um, uh, we're going to consideration for outdoor dining proposal, uh, and we have one from Red Skiff. Um, Mitch, do you want to uh, tackle that one, and we can add to it? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, exactly the same process as last week. The plan has been submitted. Um, we know exactly where where they'll be. They're they're prepared to operate within the two spaces that match uh, everybody else's. Uh, the police chief, fire chief, and DPW did their verification of the space um, yesterday, and they've signed off. Subject to that, uh, should the boards approve this evening, which the recommendation uh, to both boards is that you uh, approve it, uh, subject to uh, final sign offs. Um, the barricades can then be put in place and then John Coulon can, can go down and, and do his sign off. Okay. Excellent. Anything else on that? Somebody has to make a motion. Yes. I mean, any more uh, you want to add, Mitch, or you're all set? No, that's okay. it. We recommend approval from both boards. Perfect. Um, anyone, any further discussion on this? Okay, hearing none, is there a motion? Oh, let, let, uh, Leslie Whalen. I just wanted to point out that the tables are 72 inches apart, not the backs of the seats with people in them. Okay. Yes, I think that'll be something that um, when John goes down, uh, they've been fine tuning some of the plans a little bit to, to address some of those issues. What once the barricades get put in, uh, I think all the paper plans have altered slightly. Okay. Anything else? Hearing, uh, hearing none, let's do a roll call vote, including the Board of Health, correct? Correct. Um, Selectman George? Aye. Uh, Barbara McCarthy? Yes. Denise Donnelly? Aye. Mary Beth Murphy? Aye. Dr. Wedmore? Yes. Uh, Selectman Wilkinson? Yes. Uh, Dr. Cohen? Yes. Dr. Newman? Yes. And Selectman Murphy votes aye and the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Town Administrator's Report and Incident Command Updates. Uh, Mitch, do you have anything on that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we've already touched on uh, some of the mask patrols that have been going on. Uh, we're working very closely with the town clerk to prepare for the election next Tuesday. So polls are open on uh, Tuesday, June 30th from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we have a uh, logistics meeting at the end of the week. Uh, myself, the clerk, uh, DPW and, uh, and police. Um, we have uh, every, every possible safeguard at this point in place. So we are, um, the clerk has shrunk down the number of poll workers she has to so just the bare minimum that she needs. We have uh, barricades that have arrived that after the election will get used in the offices. So these, these room dividers, those will be set out so we can make sure that um, we're, we're properly uh, directing the flow of traffic in each of the locations. Uh, We'll be having a DPW employee assigned to each polling station from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. to do uh, continual wipe downs. Um, the clerk has also agreed to um, a couple of pauses, particularly after lunch, uh, a brief pause for the sanitizing machines to, to go through um, and, and, and put their, their fog or the mist in uh, to sanitize the area. Um, at this point, we're, we're, we're deploying everything we can. We'll, oh, we'll also have um, uh, UV uh, air purifiers in, in all the locations to try to enhance the airflow. We'll have the doors open, the windows open, and the ventilation systems where one exists. Um, 
turned on to keep the airflow going. So um, you know, certainly the clerk's office is still reminding folks they can vote early via mail. Um, I, I think uh, Pat Brown said, said to me this afternoon that uh, uh, 60 plus a day are going out um, in requests. So uh, a really good, good amount. Uh, but for those who prefer to vote in person, um, we strongly, strongly ask that you wear your mask when you come in and uh, that we ask everybody to be patient. Things may take a little bit longer. Um, there'll be plexiglass barriers up between the poll workers checking in uh, people. So um, we ask for patience uh, from everyone as they go through the day. Everybody's certainly doing their best to keep everyone safe. Right. Um, and uh, budget, uh, first portion, the board's already taken care of with the 112. Our contractor notice letters will be, uh, we've done the first round, the second round will go out uh, in the next two days, which would close that out. And um, other than that, we're, we're going to be uh, moving forward with FinCom to, to talk further about um, updated capital requests probably next week, and then we'll be back to the selectmen for further discussion. And um, in our march towards town meeting, which is yet to be set, a lot of towns had uh, a meeting the last couple days. So we're trying to look at what worked really well, what, what didn't work. So uh, more to come uh, on that for both boards at uh, your next meeting. Great. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the Board of Selectmen for Mitch? Hearing none, let's go continue on. Uh, health agent, health inspector, and health nurses. I think Dr. Newman. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Newman. It, it seems to me that um, that uh, the election in person is a fairly risky thing. Um, and is it legal or desirable before the November election to strongly encourage people to vote remotely, uh, you know, paper, you know, uh, absentee ballot? Um, I mean, is that something that we could or should, you know, have a campaign and encourage it for November? You certainly could. The um, the uh, clerk's office has been doing. I think I think Melanie is on the call. There she is. Hang on one second. I'm going to unmute Melanie. Melanie Waddell, assistant town clerk. Melanie, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, you Melanie Waddell, assistant town clerk. Um, currently on the website, there are two applications for absentee voting, and one of them is just for the municipal. Excuse me, for the municipal coming up next week. The other is an application for absentee for all elections this year. So if you use that one, you can check off all elections this year and get mail-in ballots for the September primary and the November federal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you certainly have made it easy. It's, it's a, a great process, but should through the uh, through yeah. just weekly announcements or through, I mean, should we actively promote it? Um, I mean, I've already applied because I don't really want to go and expose other people to me or me, me to them in November. Yep. And um, I unless... started a Facebook page and we've been putting it out via social media and through these meetings and, you know, as much as we can, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. If you have other suggestions of other places that might be more visible, please let us know. Yeah, I, the thing that comes to mind is Mitch's announcements. Yes. Uh, yes. Everybody gets those. Yeah, we can definitely continue to remind people. And also, we could po we could have those forms available when the people do go and vote in person, that they could pick pick one up and take it home with them, so that they're all set for the next election. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sure. We also yeah. have some in the vestibule in the back um, the back back door of town hall. So if anybody's yep. looking for one. You know, Mitch, if it's not too late, I wonder, you know how you can do a code red that's just, that's not a call, so it doesn't seem like an emergency, just an email, and um, what is it, just an email and text? Yep. I, I don't know if it's possible to do that, you know, maybe to, like early tomorrow or something, just to give people one more chance. Yeah. So it wouldn't, you know, the call sometimes is, can be alarming to people, and I know you shared it a lot in the calls, but maybe just one more email and text saying, Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll touch base with the um, the clerk's office tomorrow with Pat and Melanie to uh, come up with something that could work uh, for that. Uh, potentially attaching the applications to it and great. Um, 
So I'll, I'll chat with Pat and Melanie and we'll come up with something. Awesome. Okay, anything else, uh, Mitch? That's it, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, anything else uh, from uh, public health nurses or agents? Anyone from the Board of Health? Okay, hearing none, uh, let's go on to letter M. Uh, the BOS, uh, Board of Selectmen and Board of Health meeting schedule change to every two weeks. I've enjoyed meeting uh, bi-weekly with all of you, but maybe we're at a time where we can go back to our regular schedule. What, what, are, what are people's thoughts? So I think Dr. Wedmore asked for this and um, I, I would concur from the operations end. I think if there was a joint meeting every other week, um, we wouldn't lose any momentum on what's happening here. Okay. Are people in agreement with that from both boards? I'm ready. I think yep. the only downside would be if a business like, you know, uh, like John said earlier, like say a nail salon wanted to open up, so long as John could do that independent of these boards, because I would hate to see businesses being held held up waiting two weeks. Yeah, I think we might have to meet next week because we could potentially have a bunch of outdoor display permits. So like okay, you just said, that's a great point. I just wouldn't want to hold anyone up from opening, but I think once those settle down, we could totally move yeah. to every two weeks. Do you want to meet uh, a, a week from Thursday? Well, I'm sorry, go ahead, Barb. Uh, no, I think we also need to not forget that 4th of July is, is on our, our radar screen. Um, and just, I think next week would set us up for that as long as we uh, paid attention to that and anything we might need to do a little bit different for the, for the long weekend. And but we so can talk about it in our reopening meetings as well. Yeah. Um, next we just week need to is election night, I know. So. Oh, right. Why don't we... Could, could we meet on the 2nd of July, which is that Thursday? What, what, what do people's schedules look like? Is that, is that good? It's good for me. I'll be at camp, but I'll zoom right in. Yep, works. <laughs> it works. Is that good with everyone, both boards? Yep. Yes. Okay, you guys... So July 2nd, and then we'll go to a uh, fortnightly schedule? Yes. Yep. Um, six o'clock start, is that good? Yes. Okay. Yep. So we'll remain at six o'clock. Okay, thank you, everyone. Any, anything else on scheduling? Okay, hearing none, um, let's go. If, if um, I have one thing, Paul. Um, if at the next meeting, can we have on the agenda an item so that if... Um, a business is going to be delayed from opening. We'll give John the power to sort of get it going until final approval somehow. Is I don't. I don't think there's any. I don't. I think that for the plans, they just submit their plans, right? Besides yeah. that, I don't. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think we have anything at this point, Mary Beth, that um, would necessarily be stopped from opening. Um, Okay. John, can you think of anything that's at this point would be stopped if we didn't have the meeting? No. Um, however, I, I see the, the concern. I certainly understand it. Uh, you don't want to have a, a, a lag time. Uh, however, we have been um, uh, soliciting plans from uh, businesses and, and uh, groups in town that <clears throat> Uh, normally would see a, a, a quick turn turnaround. Uh, however, uh, I, I'd say people sh should be very well educated at this point that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, people need to uh, maintain a line of communication and uh, get their, their written plans in right away. We can always uh, adjust them, um, edit them, um, uh, change them to fit uh, a changing, uh, not only set of, of uh, a changing set of um, mandates and guidelines, but also uh, a changing set of needs uh, uh, on the ground. So that's just my appeal to, to the community to uh, uh, not wait uh, to the last minute, but uh, get your plans in uh, right away. 
and I think that uh, we've got a, a, a fairly good record of our turnaround, and we should be able to maintain that. Okay. Barb? I think we should just, um, Mary Beth and I will probably have a, a first report of the school reopening um, at the next meeting. The first meeting is tomorrow evening. Um, so just leave a little space on the agenda for us. Superintendent's done a nice job sort of setting that up and, and being very detail oriented. So um, don't you agree, Mary Beth? We'll probably have something to at least an um, initial report. Yep, it'll be that. And also, I it sounds like Amy's going to have some stuff with graduation in August that she's looking for some help with. So those two those two items might need some attention. Good. Okay. Anything else? Hearing none, let's go to our last item on the agenda, uh, item M, public comment. Uh, as we've, uh, we'll, we'll take public comment, of course. Uh, Mitch will uh, call on people. We ask that you use the hand signal um, on, on, on your computer and uh, state your name and address and uh, what you'd like to say to both boards. Go ahead, Mitch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please use the hand raise function. We have uh, Charlie CD who wishes to speak. Charlie, go ahead and unmute yourself and your address for the record, please. There we go. I'm unmuted. Charlie yeah. CV in Frank Street. Um, you know, there are three of us sitting here who are kind of interested in what the post-election schedule might bring. At least one of us is going to be joining the board. Does that mean Thursday the 2nd? Does it mean two weeks thereafter? How's this work, folks? Done. Oh, it, it means um, the 2nd. Okay. That'll be the... Good. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Okay, we have Mary Corsland, and then I see Kate Cahill and then Carol Cook. So Mary Corsland, uh, you can go ahead and unmute and your address, please. Harry Corsland to Green Street. Um, just a note, uh, if folks aren't aware, I have been campaigning as a write-in candidate for the planning board. There are two, uh, two seats that are vacant that nobody's running for, and uh, so I've uh, put my hat in the ring. Just a note there. My second, my, my question is, uh, as it relates to the entertainment permits, that the town of uh, Rockport reviews and uh, reapproves every year. Typically, that process has been completed by now, but I'm not aware that any of these permits have been reviewed or renewed. I'm just curious as to that process. Are you asking about the, the outdoor entertainment? Yes. Uh, to my knowledge, we've not received any. So in the event that a party was to come forward with a permit for an event to the extent that they would comply with COVID regulations, how would that be handled? So if there uh, was a request for outdoor entertainment, um, as it would be in the past, the selectmen would need to sign off on it if they were looking for an outdoor entertainment license. So it would need to be uh, in, a, in a selectmen's meeting. Thank Mitch, you. Has, Mitch, has DPH authorized outdoor entertainment venues as part of? Not to my knowledge. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I don't think so yet. I don't think so either. All right. Okay, uh, Kate, go ahead and unmute and full name and address for the record, please. Uh, Kathleen Cahill, 3 Mount Pleasant Street. Um, Katie's gift shop. Two things. One is at the dump, um, requiring, uh, and, and I'm all for masks at the dump. Uh, I've been doing that even before you mandated it. I thought that was actually part of the, the whole thing. Um, but you're not required to wear them driving in. And I, I usually have it, it, that just the potential to, to slow things down and uh, just to let you know, that's going to slow things down if you have a, an attendant checking that everybody has a mask because not everybody's wearing them when they're driving in, myself included, although I wear it when I get in there. Secondly, a compliment. I had a customer come in the store today and tell me that the 
public restrooms were very clean and she was very happy with them. In fact, I can hear them working in there as we speak with my doors open. Um, question, when are, are there any plans to expand the hours like 8 a.m. now that some of the breakfast places are open? Um, I know in the past they've been open 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Just a thought, because uh, 10, 10 a.m. seems a little late for breakfast. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. So at, at this point, uh, it, it's, it's based on the staffing that we have available. Um, not anticipating any expansion yet at this point. Uh, okay, Carol Cook. Carol, you can go ahead and unmute and your address for the record, please. 171B Thatcher Road. Uh, this is in relation to um, the upcoming elections, all three of them. I really don't think we have done a great job of advertising to the public that they can get in the, they can get those mail-in um, oh. applications. I suggest that that application, the one that Melanie mentioned that uh, where you can check that you want all um, elections this year, you want mail-in ballots, that that application be put right in our two post offices and, and the application should be um, posted on the bulletin board in the post office. I think I suggested this before, but nobody did anything about it. I mean, many of people go into the post office and if they see it, you know, it's just another way of promoting it because quite frankly, I am worried about what, how, what kind of shape are we gonna be in in November um, or in September, God, you know, the way this COVID thing is going, it's terrible. So we should do the best we can to protect our citizens. And so I'm just suggesting that you take a whole bunch of those applications and put them in the two post offices and post one on, the bulletin board of each. Thank you. Okay, anyone else wishing to speak, please uh, use the hand raise function or please raise your hand in your video. Okay, and anyone on the phone lines who wishes to speak, please speak okay. now, the lines are unmuted. Okay. Wow. Okay, no takers, Mr. Chair, all set. Okay, thank you, Mitch, and thank you for the public comment of all those who chose to uh, to speak. Um, is uh, it would be appropriate for Selectman Donnelly to make the motion to adjourn our last meeting? So moved, Mr. Chairman. It's been, is there a second? Seconded. Moved and seconded in uh, roll call vote. Uh, Barbara McCarthy. Yes. Mary Beth Murphy. Yes. Dr. Wedmore. Yes. Dr. Newman. Yes. Dr. Cohen. Yes. Selectman George. Aye. Selectman Wilkinson. Aye. Selectman Donnelly. Aye. <laughs> and Selectman Murphy votes aye in the motion passed. Oh, we are now adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Night, everyone. <laughs>